I'm sure as most of you in this room are probably aware, Thomas Jefferson was uh, one of the chief founders of the, the Bill of Rights, was himself uh, an ardent deist, probably the most skeptical of organized religion among our founding fathers. And yet he gave not one but two clauses regarding the independence of religion and the free, free exercise of religion. Um, how is it that that wisdom has been lost in the, in the riffraff of the conventional narrative today, which every legislative and administrative function seems to rest on the ends justi justifies the means uh, mentality? How has that greater wisdom been lost, and how do we uh, reconstruct uh, uh, Jefferson's understanding? First, I don't think it's true that Jefferson was a major influence on either of the two aspects or dimensions of the religion clause of the First Amendment. Um, secondly, Jefferson's deism is a kind of complicated thing. Now, he certainly was an Orthodox Christian and probably wasn't a Christian in a meaningful sense at all. He was a great believer in the moral teachings of Jesus. He famously uh, uh, did his own Bible where he took out the, uh, the miracles but saved the, uh, the moral uh, teaching. But the term deist today uh, connotes the guy who believes that, well, there may be a God, but he's way out there somewhere, and he starts the process going and then just pays no attention to it and lets everything go uh, on its own. That wasn't Jefferson's view. Jefferson, we have reason to believe from the documentary evidence, uh, believed that God was providential, that God was active in history. You see this in a number of his statements. First, his denial of atheism. You know, when, when he, he said, people are accusing me of atheism, this is a slander. He goes on to say why he thinks it's a slander. To me, the most powerful uh, statement of his to reveal his belief in a providential deity and not deism in this contemporary sense is his statement about slavery in his letter to Henry Lee. Uh, I think 1823, Matt Frank can help me if I'm wrong there. Tremble where he my, says, I tremble for my, he's talking about slavery, I tremble for my country when I consider that God is just and that his justice will not sleep forever. That's a God who punishes. Yes. Maybe in history, maybe outside of history, but what a God What president who does that remind punishes. you of that came along a few decades later that was also called a deist and not a Christian, right? Abraham Lincoln. Abraham yeah, that's Lincoln. That's exactly right. Yeah. You read the second inaugural yeah. address and it's yeah. not deism of our, uh, yes, of our, uh, what we right. usually think of deism. God has his own purposes, yes. Uh, the letter to the Danbury Baptists is the, is the really interesting uh, Jeffersonian contribution uh, to this because it in includes this, this uh, concept of a wall of separation between uh, church and state. So many important things we need to keep in mind, though, so, so that we don't understand, uh, don't misunderstand what Jefferson's saying here. First of all, it's very clear that the prohibition on establishments of religion was applied to the national government, not to the states. The states had, several of the states had establishments going all the way into the 1830s, and they were, the, those churches were disestablished not by federal courts interpreting the federal constitution, but they just died out or the, or the state legislatures uh, disestablished uh, them. Uh, the second thing is the concept of separation of church and state has been used beginning with two cases in the late 1940s, the 1947 Everson case and the 1948 McCollum case, to essentially cause the establishment clause of the First Amendment to go into conflict with the free exercise clause of the First Amendment. And since the word religion appears only once in the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The thereof plainly, looking back to the word religion, it's obviously problematic. It should cause us to think and wonder whether we've got the right interpretation if we put the two provisions of this clause, this one clause, into conflict uh, or use other. one to beat the other down with. Well, well yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, we, if, you, if, you, the, the, if you follow the court's jurisprudence over the years since 1947, it's never been able to get a coherent story out there. And uh, it does seem to, to, to see this tension between free exercise values and non-establishment. Yeah. And I think it tells you something about the misinterpretation of the... Uh, of the establishment provision of the clause. Some, I, I keep talking that way, establishment provision or establishment dimension of the clause, because as the late Father Richard John Newhouse pointed out, there aren't two religion clauses, free exercise and, yeah. and uh, non-establishment. There's a religion clause that has these two dimensions. Newhouse always argued that the non-establishment provision was a means to the larger purpose, which was the protection of, 
of, uh, of religious freedom. I think there's a, historically, there's a wrinkle to that, and that is that the, that the non-establishment provision was designed to protect the state establishments against encroachment by the national government or disestablishment or taxation by the national government. You can, uh, you can see how that's the case if you just consider, think your way back to say the 1790s or early 1800s. Imagine uh, the state of Connecticut has a, has a congregationalist established church. It's respecting religious freedom, but it's got an established church. Today, the Anglican Church in England right. today respects religious freedom. Uh, and Congress attempted to disestablish con uh, congregationalism in Connecticut. You're the Solicitor General for the state of Connecticut. You come in to defend your state's right to have its establishment. What are you going to argue? You're going to argue two things. First, you're going to say there's been no delegated power. There's no power delegated by the people through the Constitution to Congress to disestablish churches in the states. And then number two, you're going to say it says right here in the First no Amendment, law Congress shall make no law respecting an yeah. establishment of yeah. religion.